Hi, Connie. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Hooray! <laughs> Great. Can you see me? I can. Oh, good, good. <laughs> now, finally, we meet up, and uh, welcome to the National Critics' Choice. Uh, I uh, We will wish to thank you for coming to Singapore, and I hope you had a great time. Oh, I had a wonderful time. I love Singapore. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Now that you are less stressful, uh, <laughs> uh, I I hope you had a great trip. Um, and uh, I like I have a, I have some questions for you. And uh, before we begin, uh, the questions that I'm going to ask will basically be, uh, based on a, uh, on the issue of creative thinking, and and also of co of course uh, the 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 two books that that you are writing, uh, they've already they've already been published, right? No, no, I'm in the process of writing them. Oh, okay, but could, are you able to talk about them? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and so that's what we're gonna do. And at the same time, um, we will also talk about uh, about the, your organization and what you could do for uh, organizations and individuals who lack uh, creative thinking and the philosophy of creative thinking uh, of yourself and the organization, and as well as women for today. So is that is that all right? Yes, absolutely. That okay. sounds it sounds fascinating to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, so let's begin. Um, hi, welcome to the National Quiz Choice, and we have a wonderful guest with us right now, um, who is specialized in creative thinking, and not only that, uh, she's also a, a winner. Uh, she has won awards uh, in, in in the previous years uh, in this area of creative thinking, and it's none other than uh, Miss Connie Harriman. Uh, Miss Connie Harriman, uh, thank you for joining us here at the National Creative Choice, uh, an informal uh, interview. Uh, one of the questions that many people would like to ask is that, uh, what is creative thinking, and what actually you know uh, persuade you to champion creative thinking how important it is today oh creative thinking is incredibly important and and you know just to put it into perspective from a from a business viewpoint in 2010 ibm did a global survey of 1500 ceos and they said that creativity or creative thinking is the number one competency needed by businesses and CEOs from all around the world. Excuse me while I turn off my phone. But uh, so you see immediately that validates the what many people see is, you know, what is the logical, rational and analytical need for creative thinking? Well, there you have it. I mean, when 1,500 CEOs from all across industries from all around the world say that it is by far the number one competency needed by organizations to thrive as we move forward, then it makes sense that you need to invest in training your own organization how to become more creative. And I use the term creative thinking. It's, it means the same thing. Creativity, creative thinking is exactly the same thing. But the reason I use creative thinking is because for business people, they can accept that as a skill set that needs to be developed. If I say the word creativity, oftentimes they interpret that to mean as, you know, singing and dancing and theatrical things, which that is certainly a subset of it. But what I'm talking about is the ability to maximize the power of your brain so that you can generate more choices and bring different perspectives and, you know, and have a develop a different mindset on how to approach problems. Because as we're going into the future, the, uh, the way that we're going to approach problems is going to be different from what has worked in the past. In the past, all you needed to do was to be logical and analytical and rational. You went, you know, you had a process, you went from A to B to C to D to E. And 
if you wanted to have, find an answer, it existed somewhere in a manual. So, you know, you could find it, you know, now you can find it on the internet. But the problems that we're facing now are very ambiguous. And some of those are problems that we've not encountered before. So how do you approach a problem that where you can't find the answer in the manual and all of a sudden you need imagination. You need to uh, be able to know how to ask questions and how to, you know, you know, pull out the, the power of the diversity that exists, not only within your own organization, but also globally. So that's the, that's the importance of creative thinking. Now, does that involve uh, into intellectual, uh, you know, uh, uh, creativity? Or is it, the, uh, I think there's a term for that I heard, um, because uh, intellectual creativity or intellectual uh, curiosity, I, that's the word, intellectual curiosity, uh, is that lacking uh, in in today's world? I I don't think okay. I don't think curiosity, intellectual curiosity, is lacking. What I think is happening is that it is suppressed, because in many organizations, and and I have a an extensive corporate background in sales and marketing, and when I was in the corporate world. What happened to me was not unique in that there was a manual that told us how to dress. It told us the type of demeanor that we should exhibit whenever we were in front of clients. There was a 50-page manual on the appropriate car to drive. Now, you know, so you have an environment that is very structured and you are only going to do certain things in a certain order to be able to fit in. Fitting in was absolutely paramount. Well, with intellectual curiosity, and I and see, I come by curiosity very naturally. I have some of you know some natural gifts and I'm very appreciative of it. But curiosity can be developed. In, in terms of, you know, an organization needs to learn how to give their employees permission to be curious, to ask those questions, to where it's safe, and then to go out and start playing around with different things so that they, they feel safe to fail, you know, when things don't work out and they won't be ridiculed or shamed or, you know, shunned, you know, put it basically in a grown-up timeout. But... Uh, uh, intellectual curiosity needs to be nourished in order because you know that's part of the creative process. Now, uh, speaking about creative processes, you know, uh, is it true? And and correct me if, if we are wrong about it. Uh, does creative uh, processes is it something that is uh, you know born within us or is it cultivated? Does it? Has it, has, does it mean that we have to be trained to be creative? Okay, well, the, again, it's, creativity is a skill. It is just like riding a bike. Um, now, some of us learn, can ride a bike much easier than others because we're more athletic, right? And so it comes naturally and it comes quicker. And, uh, and I'm sure there are probably individuals out there that didn't even need someone else to teach them how to ride a bike. They just simply picked it up and figured it out on their own. And they had this innate sense of balance and they just went off and rode it. Just like there are baseball players that can just pick up a bat and hit a ball. Well, I'm not one of those people. I mean, if somebody throws a ball at me, I'm going to duck. But can I be trained to hit a baseball, you know, in, in a somewhat better fashion than I could without any training at all? Of course I can. Can I be trained to ride a bike? Yes, I, I could be trained. And so creative thinking is exactly the same way. It is a skill set that can develop, be developed. Anybody can become more creative. Some people are just, you know, naturally creative. I didn't know this about myself, but um, I always knew that I was different and people would sometimes look at me and say, Connie, you're an odd duck. And I, I ha I've had this said to me more than once. <laughs> and I never realized that it was actually a good thing until I was an adult. But it was because I naturally, because of the gifts that I had, 
saw the world differently and I brought a different perspective, you know, partly because of my upbringing and my own um, early experiences, but also because there's just something going on in my brain that said, you know, every time I sit down at a meeting and at a, I'm at a conference table and there's essentially some marketing strategy or something being presented, I would say, well, wait a minute. I see this differently. And then I would explain how I saw it. And then others would be persuaded to see it my way, but they hadn't thought of that before. So can creative thinking be taught? Absolutely. There are many tools and techniques and processes that are available to train individuals and entire organizations on how to become more creative. Amazing. Now tell me, uh... What's the difference between uh, the man and the woman? I mean, the, a lot of people, a lot of people have said that the woman's brain is different from a man's brain. Uh, I would like to get some clarification in, in this. You know, uh, are men and, uh, and women equal in creative thinking? Uh, Connie, can you hear me? I am. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I am here. Hold on. Uh, yep. Robin, can you hear me? Yes, I I can hear you. Okay. My um. Uh, 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 let me repeat the question. Are men and women are they are they equal uh, in terms of uh, the 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 way that the it, the creative thinking processes, uh, you know, are they are they made the same, or men think uh, think differently than the women? Well, uh, I can only share my own uh, perspective and just what what I've been reading. It's interesting that you ask this because I just finished reading uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book on leadership, and and, and it's called Lean In. And some people find it enormously controversial. I find it very factual. <laughs> but um, uh, I, first of all, let me just say that I am a feminist and I am incredibly proud of being a feminist. For me, that doesn't mean that I'm some crazy radical that's out of control. It simply means that I believe that women are entitled to full equality with men in all, you know, especially in, in uh, business endeavors. But, um, you know, having said that, it, it's what I've seen in my own experience, and even when I'm uh, speaking about creative creativity and creative thinking, women are much more open to talking about creativity. They're much more open and willing to believe that creativity can be taught. Whenever I give a webinar, it's a ton of women who sign up and very few men. And, uh, and, and so, you know, so I'm seeing that. And so, you know, what is it that, and I think it comes back to cultural norms that it's okay for a woman to be thinking about this flaky, you know, fluffy stuff called creativity, but it doesn't appear to fit into the logical, rational, analytical realm of where men believe that, you know, that that's more appropriate. So again, that's only, you know, just my general experience, just general reading. I am certainly not a, an expert in the, like, the brain differences between men and women, but that's what I've, I've observed. No, not a problem. Now, I hear that you are in the midst of writing two wonderful books uh, coming up. Could you tell us more about it? Okay. The um, uh, and, and when you say two, you see, like, I'm having to think, like, what was that other book about? <laughs> So the first one that I'm writing, and, I'm, and I've actually I have it partially written, is called Mind Shift, Migrant to Maine. And it is essentially about, you know, the mind shift, which taps into the creative, creative thinking part and what is part of my world today. But also because I come from very, very humble beginnings. I, um, you know, imagine a tiny little eight-year-old Mexican-American migrant farm worker in rural Texas in the United States. And I used to work in the fields from sunup to sundown. 
and to take that mind shift to become this international, you know, social media person, international speaker, international award winner. I mean, that is a massive mind shift. And so what I want in that book is a story that not only will inspire some eight-year-old girl that's reading that saying, oh, wow, you know, I can be like Connie. And, you know, when I grow up, I can travel the world and I can receive my education and I can, you know, do all these wonderful things. But also to tap into, you know, that those 20-year-old w- women. And it's more geared, I, I, I think more geared towards women because maybe it's because I am a woman and because it's it's my experiences, you know, as, you know, marrying too young, having children too young, and then trying to receive an education, you know, during that entire journey. And, um, you know, marrying my high school sweetheart, and I'm proud to say that I'm, we're still married and still romantically in love after 42 years of marriage. So that is the gist of that book. Um, and then I think that the um, uh, the other book that you're referring to, and this has been kind of on the back shelf a bit more, um, I want to write more about, well, actually I had, you know, like to, there are more concepts really at this point. Uh, part um, One book would be more about the sales perspective, about the sales and the marketing, and um, the le- because I was in corporate sales for um, over almost a decade, and it was for uh, the, the major telecommunications company in the world. It was AT&T. And I was in the top 1% of a 7,000 member sales force. So, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, think about this. There's this tiny little Mexican-American migrant farm worker that's running around with a machete whacking weeds. And then, you know, when she's uh, 37 years old, she receives her bachelor's degree. And now she's, you know, walking around selling emerging technologies for, you know, the, ma- the number one telecommunications company in the world. I mean, that is a major mind shift. But again, you know, some of the experiences that I learned and uh, I, it, it's interesting because uh, Daniel Pink, who is someone I admire tremendously, just came out with this book and the book, name of the book is To Sell is Human. And he was talking about a different way of selling well, that was my approach that I used. But again, I knew I was selling in a different kind of way, which was more relationship management versus just, you know, like I'm going to fool you and I'm going to convince you to buy something you don't really need. And I'm going to overcharge you because I, you don't have enough information. See, I always believed in selling from an authentic point of view and with integrity because it was easier to keep that same customer over, you know, many years and to try to find a a new customer every single time. Wow. Now, I must uh, say that uh, happy Easter in advance. And while celebrating Easter, uh, you had a mentor uh, by the name of uh, Ms. Robbie Motor. uh, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. Now, uh, about... uh, Miss Robbie, who was your mentor, um, one of my viewers uh, asked me, what are the three key things that you actually learned from her before you pursue on your own? And was there a time there where uh, where she actually shared one key uh, moment with you about creative thinking? Well, the, the, the main things that I learned from Robbie, number one, uh, you need to understand, I, I don't know her age exactly, but let's say late 70s. And she, people, you know, you have role models that you look up to. And with Robbie, what happened was my mother was, a, you know, she was a migrant farm worker. So she could never, ever share with me, you know, know, what's the proper path to take in the corporate world. She couldn't mentor me about corporate things. Uh, She never really understood exactly what I did when I was at AT AT&T. And Robbie has a vast and extensive corporate background. I I mean, she's worked in some major governmental organizations, some major corporations. She's been an entrepreneur. And to this day, she is traveling all across the United States and globally 
and she's a public speaker. She's incredibly intelligent. She's incredibly generous. And her big thing is that she connects people. And if she, you know, because she meets so many people, she's, she's, I mean, here she is at her late seventies and she is a social media, you know, maverick. Uh, she has a blog, you know, she's tweeting, she's, I mean, you know, on LinkedIn, she's doing all of those things. And, uh, and so what I admired about her was number one, when I'm in my late seventies, I want to be just like Robbie Motter. <laughs> That's number one. Um, the other one, the second thing is that I want to follow her example of connecting people together who can help each other, who otherwise might not meet. And, and that is, you know, she, she calls herself the queen of net, the networking queen. And I think that that is, you know, so generous and it's so valuable to everyone. And then the third thing that she shared, key things that she shared with me, and I share it with my audiences, is to show up. And oh. what does this mean? That means even when you're afraid to enter a room, even when you're afraid to go fly to Singapore, say, and I wasn't afraid to fly to Singapore, but say, let's pretend that you were. Uh, but I have been afraid to go to an event where I knew there would be 1,200 men and there might be a few women. And I walked in and I saw a wall of white men, older men, and I was scared. I mean, I just, I had a moment of, I was a bit taken aback and I, and I could hear Robbie's voice in my ear, show up, just show up. And I walked in and it was great. Made some incredible contacts. There were about 20 women in that sea of men. But, you know, because I had the courage, because I had that little voice in my ear, I showed up anyway. And I don't think that I'm not, I don't need a lot of mentoring because I'm pretty self-assured and confident. And so for me to find someone who can actually mentor me is re really magnificent. And Robbie Motter fits that bill perfectly. Now, speaking about uh, fitting the bill, you had been very successful and had a great career in, over at AT&T. Um, could you give three key advice uh, to women around the world, you know, on how you actually survive <laughs> and succeed, uh, you know, uh, you know, in uh, in the corporate life, and what does it take to succeed? Uh, many because many women are are wondering, you know, uh, I I I'm tired and I'm 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 facing a huge challenge uh, among men, and uh, you know, I'm running out of of ideas. Um, and I'm also having some, uh, and they also face some depression. I have one question. I, I'm, I'm having a depression right now. Uh, what, what should I do? <laughs> oh, well, uh, until that, uh, first of all, uh, survive is your word, not mine. <laughs> I, I would say thrived. <laughs> uh, and let me give just a tiny bit of background. Uh, I grew up with eight brothers. And I was uh, uh, number four out of out of that, um, you know, I had older brothers and, and five younger brothers. And I didn't realize it until I entered the corporate world. But growing up in the rough and tumble world of eight boys prepared me for the cor corporate life. And you know, part of it, part of it was, and and, and I'm talking about the, the person who's a, a bit depressed because. I know it's very challenging. Uh, women, we tend to want to ask for permission to speak up. Well, I mean, we want to, you know, if there's a conference room table discussion going on, we'll raise our hand and, you know, say, please, hello, would you look at me, give me permission to speak. Guys don't do that. They just jump in and they just say whatever they want, whenever they want, and they don't care whether it sounds smart or not. And, and when, you know, and I think that what my brothers taught me was to just jump in there and speak up and you have to sit at the table. You can't sit, you know, whenever you go into a room, you can't be sitting next to the wall. 
I don't care what your position is, sit at the table. And then the other, you know, the other thing is that you have to speak up. You have to, you know, anytime, you know, there's something presented and you're thinking, well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, say that. I'm not so sure that's such a great idea because da, 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 da. You know, they'll just sit there thinking, oh, I'm not so sure it's such a good idea. And then some guy jumps in and, and says, I'm not so sure that's a good idea because I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. Well, you know, that wasn't very substantial, but now they think he's smart. And you're, you're dumb because you're not speaking up. If you're quiet, people just think you're dumb. So, you know, the, I think that, you know, perception is key. Of course, you have to be professional. And it, you have to be polite, but I think women are too polite. Um, I think that, uh, let me think about like three key things that um, one, okay, so one would be to speak up. You know, the other would be to always sit at the table. And then the last thing would be, I think, uh, visibility. Visibility, because if I am doing an outstanding job and nobody knows about it, then it really doesn't matter. Because if somebody else is doing a less than outstanding job, but they're the ones that give a presentation to the executive leadership, Whenever the executive leadership says, oh, we need to set, have someone to send to this really plum, wonderful assignment that's, you know, global, you know, VP or other, you know, who, who, do, you know, who, who can we send? They're going to remember the person that gave a presentation to them. They're not going to remember that person that's back in the back office that's working 80 hours a week and, you know, making, you know, being a top sales performer. It, they're going to Pick the person they can see. So it's visibility. And, um, and so you need to tap into those middle managers, you know, whether it's your branch manager or, you know, as high, high level as you can and let them know, hey, you know, the next, you know, you know, what's your latest project that you're working on? I want to be, you know, I want to work with you on that and I want to present. Anytime you have a chance to present, jump at it because and, and develop your speaking skills. That way you're a good presenter. Well, what's the next trends that we are seeing right now f uh, for the next generation of women? Um, you know, and what kind of leadership should women possess? How important is leadership? Because right now, uh, the world is saying that they are running short of leaders. Is that true? Um, yes, and and um, and again. Um... I can't say enough about uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, and, and I just finished reading it two days ago, and she has many, many studies in there that shows the shortage of women in leadership positions and what, you know, that there, there's just an enormous gap, but the the main reason that the world needs more women leaders is because there are actually statistics that show that the return on equity stock prices go up and they, they you know, companies become much more valuable whenever you have up, you know, at least 40 percent of your board members are, you know, are women. And uh, and so women are incredibly valuable and you know i think you know personally think and this is the feminist part coming out but i personally think that every single company in the world should mandate that the, that their boards are 40 percent women and i think that all leaders should be a minimum of 40 percent women and right now the, the numbers are very small um and um and you know if you want you know exact statistics again i would send you to um cheryl sandberg's book lean in and i'm not getting paid for promoting her book i'm just enthusiastic about it. <laughs> so, no but, but what's yeah. next what's next for you and how can our viewers get in touch with you uh on on your organization and that specialize in creative thinking so, well, the uh, viewers can reach me. Um, I, I have a blog. It's called developyourcreativethinking.com. I, my email is connie.harriman at att.net. That's C-O-N-N-I-E dot H-A-R-R-Y-M-A-N at att.net. And I'm also on Twitter. Um, my handle is at creativeconnie. 
and I'm also on LinkedIn and just, you know, search for Connie Harriman and um, yeah, I, I welcome you as a follower. But uh, so, you know, there's a, a lot of different ways to reach me and I'm very accessible. I live in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina in the USA, but I travel globally. So, you know, just reach me, you know, and, and of course, you know, I do webinars from time to time and I'm also available, you know, online to do Skype calls or, or whatever, you know, you need to talk about creative thinking. So, but um, what's next for me? I want to go to China. <laughs> um, the uh, American Creativity Association is having their creati uh, creativity conference there in Shanghai in 18 months. It's in August and um, I fully intend to be there. And I wanted to always, you know, travel to China. It's on my bucket list, and it was a, it was somewhat annoying to me when I realized that I flew right over China to get to Singapore. And so you see, China would actually be a shorter trip. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem at all. And uh, we hope to see you again soon, uh, very shortly when you do come to China and do stop by in Singapore. Um, but uh, once again, we'd like to thank you for sharing with us your passion. And, uh, and, and once again, uh, folks, uh, please do contact uh, our guest here who has just shared with us her secrets on creative thinking and how important it is. And that is none other than Ms. Connie Harriman. Once again, thank you. Thank you very much, Robin.